Ladies and gentlemen, cadets, faculty, and guests, please welcome Colonel Dave Harper, head of the Department of English and Philosophy at West Point. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the superintendent and the dean, welcome to the sixth annual Zengerly Family Lecture in the Arts and Humanities at West Point. I welcome all of you who, who have joined us here in Eisenhower Hall, as well as those joining us online. It is also an honor to be joined here today, in person once again, by members of the Zengerly family, the Honorable Joe Zengerly and his wife, Linda, as well as their son, Tucker, his wife, Daniela, and their two children, Joseph, who is 15, and Benjamin, who is seven. I hope I got the ages right. If I didn't, talk to me afterward. It is your generous support that makes these events possible. We remain ever grateful for this outstanding lecture series that encourages us, challenges us annually to listen to diverse viewpoints, to reflect, to think deeply about the things that matter. Thank you. The Zingerly Family Lecture is hosted by the Department of English and Philosophy and the West Point Humanities Center. The Humanities Center is a project that is gift funded through our fantastic Association of Graduates and enhances West Point's ability to mobilize the liberal arts and humanities to produce reflective thinking leaders for tomorrow. The Zingerly Family Lecture and West Point's commitment to the humanities acknowledges that a broad liberal arts education is the indispensable foundation for producing officers and citizens who act for the good of the nation. This year, I'm delighted to introduce a speaker whose recent and ongoing work invites us to think about language and about war. Both are fitting subjects for this time and this place, and most fitting for you an audience largely of cadets, some who will graduate and commission as officers in a few short weeks. Professor Emily Wilson is the College for Women Class of 1963 Term Professor of the Humanities, Professor of Classical Studies, and Graduate Chair of the Program in Comparative Literature and Literary Theory at the University of Pennsylvania. She was named a 2006 Fellow at the American Academy in Rome, a 2019 MacArthur Fellow, and a 2020 Guggenheim Fellow. She's the author of several notable translations and critical studies, including The Death of Socrates, Hero, Villain, Chatterbox, Saint, The Greatest Empire, A Life of Seneca, and Mocked with Death, Tragic Overliving, from Socrates to Milton. The New York Times Book Review characterized her seminal translation of Homer's Odyssey as a revelation. Upon my own first looking into Emily Wilson's Odyssey, I admit that I was caught off guard by the very first line, tell me about a complicated man. My mind ranged back over previous translations Robert Fagels, who read to us once over in Robinson Auditorium some decade past, came to mind. Richmond Lattimore, even venerable George Chapman, a complicated man. Where was the man of twists and turns, the man of many ways, the man that many a way wound with his wisdom, a complicated man? It struck me. It stayed with me. And as I read on, I realized that in that very first line, Professor Wilson's translation reminded us that this epic had been handed down to those of us who don't have ancient Greek through a long chain of men. She reminded us that with translation comes choice and with choosing reason, and reasons that might stray from appropriate meaning. From the first line to the last, her translation made Homer sing anew for us. A revelation indeed, she even had Homer singing on Twitter. Today, I believe she's gonna talk to us about her ongoing work with Homer's Iliad, 
and I'm excited to see what perspective she will provide us with that work. These epics remind us, all of us, that war is not an abstract battle between two armies or a clash between tanks and drones. War isn't a blocking and tackling chart for some game. War is an intensely, viscerally human affair. We need only turn on the news today to see this. In Homer, we meet women and children worried for their loved ones and for their own safety within the town in which they have refuge and shelter. We mourn with fathers for their sons. We see women treated as prizes to, to be fought over, raped. Studying Homer reminds us that the myths we tell ourselves about our people or about our nation or about war itself matter. The myth that defines people just over the border as belonging to our rightful empire leads to folly and defeat in human tragedy. Emily Wilson's translations of Homer will not let us forget that language matters in how we perceive men and women, particularly the women, caught up in the vice of war. Her work invites us to inhabit a new, or perhaps older, or perhaps just different perspective. And inhabiting different perspectives, being open-minded and intellectually curious, is a habit you must carry with you as you graduate from West Point to serve in war and peace. Professor Wilson will read and speak to us for about 30 minutes and then take your questions. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to the Zingalese for making this visit possible. And thank, thanks to all of you for being here and giving me your attention. I'm truly honored to be here at West Point. It's the first time I've visited here, and it's an amazing place. I'm particularly grateful for the opportunity to visit West Point because, as you've just heard, quite a lot of my work, especially over the last 10 years, has focused on the two Homeric poems, which both focus in different ways on the representation of, of war, of ancient mythical war. And I'm conscious that each of you has perspectives on life in the military and on war that aren't necessarily available to me as a civilian. So I'm extra excited to hear your questions and your comments after the talk. I'll be talking today, as I, as I said, about this wonderful Greek, ancient Greek epic poem about war, the Iliad. I'm currently finishing up my tr verse translation of that poem, which will be coming out next year. And as with the Odyssey, I'm using iambic pentameter. I have lots of thoughts about the process of translation, my goals with translation, which I'm not going to focus on in the talk today. But I'd love to answer any questions you may have about it, either at the end of the talk here or in the colloquium afterwards. Um, in the lecture today, I'm going to focus primarily on the Iliad and its representation of war. I'm going to spend a few minutes just introducing the poem to you, because I know many of you may not be familiar with it. Um, and I want you to have a sense of what the Iliad is about and what might be surprising about it as a representation of the Trojan War. Then I'm going to turn to talk in more depth about how the Iliad represents war and the various different ways that warfare is experienced by human, divine, and even inanimate characters within the poem. The diversity of perspectives on war seems to me a, a huge element in what this poem can, can, can offer to us. I'll show how, in Homer, war is represented as the cause of both great glory and excitement, and also terrible grief and loss. And I'll also focus on the tension between two different ways that elite warriors can experience and imagine their own special place of honor in a society. A tension between ego or individualism and community. So just to set the scene, the Iliad, so this is, this is the structure of my talk. The Iliad and the Odyssey were composed around the seventh century BCE, so around 3,000 years ago, it's a long time ago. Both poems are looking back to an even more distant past, the mythical Trojan War. The Iliad, on which I'm going to focus today, is set during the war itself. Iliad means Troy poem, because Ilias is another name for Troy. And the Odyssey takes place 10 years later. 
It's about Odysseus as a veteran warrior who comes home from war and has to adjust to civilian life and to a different identity when he, once he's off the battlefield. These two monumental written poems draw on a set of folk tales and oral poetic traditions that were many centuries old at the time of their composition. The narrator of the Iliad expects that the audience will already know um, the main characters in the story, just as you already know who Batman is. The expected audiences of the Iliad would already know who Hector and Achilles are in the main outlines. Um, it, it tells a mythic plot about a great war waged between an assemblage of forces from the Greek-speaking world on, on the city of Troy, which is located in what's now Turkey. Yes. So just to give you orientation in geography. Um, Paris, a prince of Troy, was assigned by the gods to be the judge of a conflict or competition between three goddesses. Hera, the most powerful queen of the gods, who offered him power. Athena, who's represented on the West, uh, on the West Point crest, the military goddess, who offered him wisdom or intelligence or strategy. And Aphrodite, the goddess associated with sexual desire, who offered him the most attractive woman in the world as his wife. Paris chose Aphrodite, but unfortunately, Helen, a daughter of Zeus and the most beautiful woman in the world, turned out to have a, have a husband already. While staying as a guest in the house of Menelaus, lord of Sparta, Paris abducted Helen and took her back to Troy. Menelaus and his brother, the wealthy, powerful Agamemnon, assembled a massive naval force and set sail to make war on Troy. But Troy was a rich city with strong defensive walls, which had been built by the gods, by Apollo and Poseidon, to with withstand any attack. Several gods, including Aphrodite, gave their aid to the Trojans. So the Trojans, according to legend, managed to withstand the besieging armies for 10 years, until finally Odysseus, um, who's of course favored with the strategic help of Athena, devised the, the scheme of creating a huge wooden horse as a supposed gift to the temple of Troy hiding a troop of armed Greeks inside. So when the horse was dragged into the city, the troops jumped out, opened the gates for their comrades, and finally sacked Troy. So these various elements were part of the oral poetic tradition and would have been known to the audience and composer of the Iliad. But it's a shock to many first-time readers of, of the poem to realize how little the Iliad has of any of what I just said. The Iliad has almost nothing of this material. It doesn't tell the beginning of the Trojan War story. It doesn't tell at the beginning of the poem, let's start with the judgment of Paris. It doesn't do that. We don't get to the Trojan horse. We don't get to the sack of Troy. Instead, this long 24 book poem focuses on a tiny little episode that takes place over the course of roughly a month and a half in the penultimate year of the conflict. It focuses on a quarrel between two Greek warriors, Achilles and Agamemnon. The Iliad seems to studiously avoid what might seem like the most obvious ways of telling the Trojan War story. You might think that a Greek story about war between Greeks and Trojans would surely present the war as us versus them. It's the West versus the East. At least if you look at the map, you might think that would be a way you could tell the story. It would have been easy enough for the narrator of the Iliad to present the Trojans as dishonest foreigners, or in Greek terms, barbaroi, the people who say barbar -bar because they don't speak Greek properly. Paris violated the norms of hospitality by abducting his host's wife. Um, the Trojans could have been presented in terms of the prejudicial stereotypes that Greek speakers in later periods certainly held um, against non-Greek speakers who lived to their east. For instance, by presenting them as liars, thieves, superstitious, effeminate, or lovers of luxury. This isn't at all the story the Iliad tells. The Trojans seem to speak exactly the same language and worship exactly the same gods as the Greeks. There is no cultural difference, and there seems to be no ethical difference either. Hector, the most powerful warrior on the Trojan side, is a, is a deeply sympathetic character in his commitment to the defense of his family and his people. Surprisingly, the poem's central conflict is not between Greeks and Trojans, but between one Greek and another, and maybe also between one Greek and himself. The poem begins with a violent quarrel between the two great leaders, Agamemnon and Achilles, 
who are notionally on the same side in the war, over which of them will get to take or enslave a particular captured woman. The conflict is more generally about the hierarchies within the allied Greek forces and the ways that honor and status are apportioned between the most elite warriors. The Iliad is a poem about war, but more generally it's a poem about conflict and about the various ways that conflict operates, both through language and also through weapons, bodies, wars. Conflict can motivate people to improve themselves, to win glory, to be the best, to strive for excellence. Conflict can also tear communities apart. Achilles, the fastest, most athletic warrior on the Greek side, is enraged when the ultra-wealthy, socially powerful Agamemnon, who has the most troops at his command, takes the woman that Achilles originally had, thus pulling rank on him and diminishing his status, dissing him. The poem begins, Goddess, sing of the cataclysmic wrath of Peleus' son, Achilles, cause of so much suffering for the Greeks that sent many strong souls to Hades, making men a feast for birds and pray for dogs. The plan of Zeus was moving to its end, beginning when those two argued first, Lord Agamemnon and glorious Achilles. These first lines identify the poem's subject as an emotion, the wrath of Achilles, and make clear that the wrath of this mortal human being is intertwined with the misty plans of the sky god, the cloud, ga cloud gatherer, Zeus. After the quarrel with Agamemnon, Achilles refuses to fight for the Greek army against the Trojans. He spends the majority of the poem, between books 1 and 18 out of 24, sulking in his tent. It's another of the many surprises of this poem that a narrative that seems to be so focused on external military action presents inaction as the most effective and in fact most deadly form of action. Achilles kills far more people by doing nothing than he does by fighting. Achilles is the son of a sea goddess, Thetis, who's silver-footed, which is why I'm wearing these shoes. Um, <laughs> um, and the, Thetis appeals to Zeus to ensure that Achilles' anger causes the maximum number of casualties possible on his own side. Because in his absence, the Trojans gain ground and almost manage to destroy the Greek ships by fire. Achilles rejoins the battle only after his dearest friend and companion, Patroclus, has entered the battle wearing Achilles' armor and, not, and been killed by Hector. At that point, Achilles' rage shifts its focus and does become directed not, not, not so much at Agamemnon, but against the Trojans and specifically against Hector as the killer of his beloved friend, his comrade. He, Achilles eventually kills and tries to desecrate the body of Hector. The rage of Achilles seems to only end or change into grief um, once Hector's father, Priam, comes to recover his son's body from his killer, and the two men weep together over their different but parallel forms of loss and sorrow and awareness of the grief that war brings. Achilles allows for a ceasefire for 12 days to give the Trojans time to mourn for Hector and hold his funeral before the fighting starts again. So to focus a little bit more on the, Achilles, on the, on the Iliad's representation of war, I'd like to read to you a few mostly pretty famous passages from the Iliad in my translation. And emphasize through doing that how complex and how multi-layered the poem is in its account of both the motives for war and the ways it's experienced differently by different characters. Um, as I suggested, I'll also emphasize that for the most elite warriors, the only ones, the only human beings who have a choice about being in war, the poem traces a complex relationship between war and social status. Warriors can see themselves as either serving their communities and their loved ones, or as serving their own ego. The danger that the yearning for individual honor among the most brave and elite fighters can be, di can be disastrous for the community and for the fighters themselves, I think is one of the central lessons that I think is actually still worth taking from the Iliad. And it's a, I think it's a fascinating set of um, issues that maybe affect all of us, but perhaps especially those who are in the military. The Iliad constantly aestheticizes and glorifies violence. And any reader or listener ought to get a visceral understanding of how thrilling it can be to hold a spear or a other weapon in your hand, to plunge it into the soft flesh of your enemy. There's a sense of excitement um, that the poem's narrator vivid, vividly conveys. 
in holding and using powerful weapons, in using talent, skill, training, and courage for a purpose. At the same time, the Iliad makes its audience or readers feel equally clearly in every encounter how it feels to be the victim, how it feels to watch the darkness closing over your eyes for the last time. The poem constantly shows the terrible pathos and horror and grief of war. What, most things that, that exist in the Homeric poetic universe have their own standard ways of being described, and the standard ways that war is described include saying repeatedly that it's polu dakrutos, it's full of tears, much tearful war, but it's polu stonos, it's full of grief. Ares, the god associated most closely with war, could be presented in a war poem as this is the god that we all think is the greatest, and, he, and yet he clearly is not in the Iliad. He's presented as the most hateful of all the gods, the curse of humanity. He's described as protoloigos, the ruin of, of humans. The poem recognizes very fully that war can cause total ruin, both for the beautiful, strong warriors who die young, far away from their homes and their families, who won't get to welcome them, get them back, and for the widowed, raped, enslaved women and children whose lives may be devastated or ended by war. The poem centers on a series of terrible paradoxes, including the fact that there's an intimate relationship between anger and grief. War in this poem is caused by the elite warrior's desire to prove his superiority, to gain greater glory and greater wealth than anyone else in his society. And yet that desire to fight is also motivated by the love that warriors feel, most directly for each other, more generally for their homelands and their communities, and their grief for their dead comrades and their stolen women. In order to retrieve or avenge the ones you love, you have to keep on fighting, and that will cause the killing of more people who are always loved by someone else. The characters in this poem seem to be in a constant, apparently unending cycle of action and reaction, loss and reparation. The poem constantly makes us ask, where does one action begin and, and another end? Can one loss or gain stand in for another? That's partly why in the, in the first lines that I just read you, the juxtaposition of end and beginning is part of what's there in those first lines. Where does it end? When does it begin? It can be very hard to say. The quarrel that is the focus of the poem's plot between Achilles and Agamemnon join, joins, draws our attention to a pair of connected problems that reside in the warrior culture of, the, of this society. Those problems are, first, the tension between the warrior's role as a member of community who fights to help his comrades, and on the other, the warrior's role as an individual who fights to preserve and pre increase his own individual status above his comrades, who wants to be better than any anyone else, either in battle or in strategic discussions or in council or speaking. The quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles um, takes place for very mixed motives on, on the side of both, both these fighters. Agamemnon wants to maintain his own dominance over the allied Greek troops to ma maintain order, which is partly perhaps for the, for the good of the community. He also wants to shore up his own social status and economic power. Achilles speaks out against Agamemnon, partly because he can see that the whole community is suffering from the plague which is caused by the gods' wrath, which is caused by Agamemnon overstepping his, his, his rightful actions. But Achilles is also outraged on his own behalf because his own special status has been slighted. slighted. The second point of tension that's clear already in the quarrel is that there's a fundamental ambiguity about what it means for a warrior to be the best and about the system of relative power within the allied Greek forces. In functioning military systems, it's essential for the maintenance of order that there is a clear chain of command. The Iliad depicts a warrior society that doesn't have a clear chain of command. And part of what's, what's at stake in the poem is showing you very, very clearly what, what, can, what can go horribly wrong when there's no clarity about chain of command. Agamemnon is the Greek leader with the largest number of troops at his command and the greatest wealth. And he's the one who has been the primary instigator of the rally of troops from all over the Greek-speaking world to get his brother's wife back. But all the Greek commanders have their own troops brought from home territories. They haven't agreed to treat Agamemnon as the leader of the leaders or the high commander. There's no military structure within, he, within which Agamemnon pulls rank over Achilles. Greece itself, as a unified entity or nation, did not exist in the archaic period when this poem was being composed. Each of the Greek leaders 
is a dominant figure within his own tribal te territory. There's no single structure of command for all of them. So it's a problem to Achilles that Agamemnon pulls rank by taking his war prize. There's a clash here also of incommensurable values. Both Agamemnon, Achilles, and many other elite fighters all have a good case for being the best of the best, according to different criteria, given that there's no um, single category by which we choose who's the, who's the best. There's no obvious way to decide who gets to, to pull rank over everyone else. If the, if the hierarchy is based on military skill, Achilles is obviously the best of the, of the Greeks. Agamemnon is the best in terms of wealth and social influence. The Iliad was composed in a period when various smaller tribal communities were just starting to form larger collective units. The prototypes for the new model of the city-state, like later classical Athens, when the old power structures um, in certain regions of the Greek-speaking world were giving way to what would become proto-modern systems of government, like oligarchy or democracy. But those things are just at the this, at this dawn of coming into being at the time of the Iliad. So there's this whole question that's constantly there in the debates and conflicts in the Iliad about how are we even going to have a collectivity? What is politics going to look like in this changing society? A, this is a world in which several forms of social structure sit uneasily together. In keeping with the depiction of Ares as the ruin of humanity, the Iliad makes it clear that most people in war have no desire to be there. We're told just once in passing that Agamemnon and the Allied forces levied fines on people who refused to join the expedition, making it economically ruinous to stay home. We're reminded repeatedly that there's a huge gap between the experience of the common troops, the unnamed men who took the oar to bring the huge ships to Troy, who presumably have none of the complicated armor and equipment of the elite fighters, who are almost never named. We're occasionally reminded that the majority of those Greek fighters are fighting against their will, as when Thersites in Book 2 speaks out against the decision-making of the elite warriors and gets beaten up by Odysseus, using, clearly symbolically, a golden staff to beat up the guy who's speaking out against him. Similarly, we learn about the battle tactics of the, um, of the old officer Nestor, involving creating a formation so that the majority of troops are forced into battle. Nestor had placed the cavalry in front, the horses with their chariots and drivers. He set the infantry to guard the rear, many fine fighters as a barricade in battle, and he drove the commoners into the middle so that all of them would be compelled to fight against their will. Even beyond the battlefield, the Iliad reminds us and focuses on the experience of the non-combatants, including old people, children, and women, who find themselves caught up in war through no choice of their own. War causes the rape, enslavement, and death of non-combatants, as well as the sack of cities and the loss of homes. The civilian populations, both at Troy, but then also in far distant Greek territories, suffer bereavement, loss, as well as slavery and death. Because, this, because of all these sons, husbands, and fathers who destroy each other in the war. So then why, according to the Iliad, do wars continue? One set of answers has to do with the largest scale that the poem provides, the gods. A myth that's never told in the Iliad, as, most, as I've already suggested, many of the most famous myths about the Trojan War don't come in the Iliad, and this is conscious exclusion of a lot of, a lot of the things that are too familiar to tell. Um, but the, um, according to, to one myth, um, the Zeus, 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 the sky god, wanted to decrease the population of humans, because if there were too many humans, then it reduces the power of the gods. So he planned the biggest war the world had yet known, the Trojan War, whose main purpose, according to this legend, was to reduce the human population. Within the poem, the gods and goddesses each have their own separate purposes, which involve maintaining and increasing their own honor, promoting their favorites, and doing deals with one another, like the deal between Thetis and Zeus, to ensure temporary success for the Trojans. In one of the most chilling moments of the poem, at the start of book four, Hera and Zeus argue about the, tro the future of Troy, and Hera, who hates Troy, proposes a compromise. If Zeus, her husband and brother, will allow for the total devastation of this city that she doesn't like, he'll be allowed to destroy three more cities that she particularly likes, 
Sparta, Mycenae, and Argos, all of which had suffered multiple sacks in the archaic period in, in real life. The scene reminds us that individual wars take place within a very large historical, political, and geographical set of complex circumstances. They hint at the ways that the particular decision-making of one general, one officer, or one soldier may be within a, a smaller context than the, the vast historical context of the whole war, or the whole, the whole narrative of conflict between, between peoples. Even the gods seem sometimes to defer to even larger, even mistier forces, such as the scales of destiny that Zeus holds up to decide when Hector must die. On a grand metaphysical level, maybe war is more or less incomprehensible. On another level, for those who participate in the battlefield, there are moments when the, the motive to fight seems simple, even elemental. This applies even to the weapons of war, the spears and arrows hurled from one warrior to another, who are often described as if they have agency and a sense of purpose and a desire. Um, weapons are often, quote, hungry to sate themselves on human flesh. Sometimes the human warriors themselves seem to become dr driven by the yearning for battle in a similar way, as a fundamental impulse to satisfy the hunger for the thrill of conflict. Um, the warriors in the Iliad sometimes feel such intense joy on the battlefield that war becomes sweeter to them than the, short, the, than the thought of returning home. For some characters, there are other motivations, perhaps less elemental, but fairly straightforward. There are clear economic causes to the war, as for all wars. Agamemnon clearly stands to become even more monumentally rich through war than he already is. The Trojans have economic reasons to hang on to their wealth as well as their lives. More personally, both Greeks and Trojans fight defensively to save their own lives and the structures in which they live, the city for the Trojans, the ships and camp for the Greeks, and to save their families, their comrades, their women, both, and their comrades both living and dead. Saving the dead is also a crucial motivation for the warriors in the battlefield in the Iliad. Mo many of the most intense battles hinge on the desire of one group of f fighters to strip a dead enemy of his weapons and thus gain both glory and wealth, and to, to take his dignity. In, by, in taking a dead body, you take the man's social status. Often the loyalties that motivate a warrior are deeply personal, as when Achilles returns to the fighting to avenge his beloved friend. The battle is often constructed not out of the grand geopolitical causes that might be there in the background, but for individuals, out of individual vendettas and individual grief and anger and loyalties. The warriors very often don't want to attack a random member of the enemy, but one specific person who's just killed a dear friend or a family member. Fighting is also motivated not just by love and loyalty between comrades, but also by the warrior's desire to outdo others, including both his enemies and his comrades. A fundamental element in the Iliadic elite warrior's motivation is the desire to have a particular kind of name or reputation or social status, including the glory that extends into the future when the warrior hopes to be remembered even after his death, perhaps in a burial mound built to memorialize him. And in fact, on the coast of, a of Asia Minor, there are, archaeologically, there are these burial mounds which are, according to legend, were, were imagined as this is the tomb of, of Achilles, this is the tomb of Hector the landscape is going to be marked by these famous warriors' lives. People are also remembered after, after death if they're glorious enough, if they win enough chaos, through the singing of poetry itself. The Iliad purpose, Iliad's purposes include the memorialization of the dead, the preservation of names and stories from people who fought long ago. It matters that all of these names keep being repeated and they they live even to our day because they're sung. Homeric Greek is rich in vocabulary for different elements of the construction of social status, the possibility of repayment of damage done to a person's rights or social position. Some of this terminology, like timer or, or geras, suggests that status is acquired and symbolized and perpetuated through concrete material things, like getting the best cuts of meat at a banquet or like having stripes on your uniform. It's about the, the more wealth or prizes you can accrue, the more important you are within warrior society. Other words, such as words that you probably know uh, from their English borrowings, um, kudos 
suggests that honor may be more a function of what a warrior has been able to do, and especially, perhaps, of how many people he's been able to kill. Kleos, which is cognate with the verb kaleo, to call or to name, um, suggests that status is built not just out of things and not just out of actions, but out of language. Within the Iliad, language may be one of the most fundamental, most important weapons of war. Warriors are inspired to fight by rousing speeches that remind them of their identities as warriors, and also by speeches that threaten shame if they fa fail to participate in battle. All the warriors, as in most ancient warrior society, are men. The language associates warrior values also very clearly with masculinity. Words such as agenothumos, agenoria, and hypernoria, all of which are etymologically related to ana, meaning man, suggest an association between pride or aggression and an excess of masculinity. Obviously, this is a society where they don't know what testosterone is, but there's some kind of understanding of something that we might translate into those terms. When men urge other men to fight in the Iliad, they often tell them, be men, implying that the correct performance of masculinity entails courage in, in battle. But as Robert Graciosi has noted, no character in Homer ever tells another to be a man in the singular. So there's something going on in that which I'm going to unpack in, in the next few minutes of the talk. The poem recognizes that solitary, as opposed to collective masculinity, can be potentially dangerous, leading from courage to arrogance. In the world of the Iliad, the most powerful men always risk being too masculine, either for their own good or the good of their communities. At the same time, elite men feel an internalized pressure to live up to their role as men by showing courage on the battlefield. In one of the most famous speeches in Book 13, Odysseus, who has been trapped um, amid enemy lines all by himself with no companions to help him, turns this rhetoric on himself and tells himself, even when he's all, when all alone, he must maintain that social role required of the warrior, which entails being willing to risk his life in battle. Quote, Odysseus spoke to his own proud heart in his confusion. What will become of me? It would be awful to run away in fear from all these Trojans, but even worse if I am captured here alone. Zeus made the other Greeks take flight. Why does my spirit even ask this question? I know a coward leaves the battlefield. A champion must stand his ground and fight, ready to strike or suffer any blow. So I'm going to try to pick up on that warrior ethic with a series of other famous speeches from the poem that offer related but significantly different perspectives on this same implicit trade, the willingness to risk life in battle for the sake of glory or chaos. I hope you can hear in listening to these speeches the importance, perhaps, and you can argue with me if you don't agree with this, but the importance, perhaps, of community and some degree of humility and a sense of the warrior role as involving service rather than just the pursuit of individual chaos, even for the proudest, bravest, most successful warriors. The first speech I'll read, which comes from book 13, is in some ways the most straightforward. I'm sorry, book, book 15, and I'm going to let me go forward. It's, a second. Sorry. Um, it's the moment when Sarpedon, a mortal son of Zeus, who will soon die in battle, explains to his dear comrade, Glaucus, that elite warriors earn their privileged status by their willingness to show courage in battle um, and to risk their lives. He explains that trade is worthwhile because no humans, even those who don't fight, get to live forever. Quote, why is it, Glaucus, that you and I receive such lavish honors? Why do we get the finest, cut, finest seats at banquets? Full cups of wine, the choicest cuts of meat. And why does everyone in Lycia gaze at both of us as if we were divine? Why was the largest state assigned to us beside the banks of Xanthus, lovely land of vineyards and of plowland thick with wheat? We have all these advantages, and therefore we have to stand beside our countrymen, now at the front line, and confront the heat of battle, so that any Lycian fighter wearing thick armor may declare, our rulers, the man who hold great sway in Lycian lands, are not dishonorable. They eat fat sheep and drink good vintage wine as sweet as honey, 
but they are also brave and strong. They fight among the Lycian fighters at the front. You see, my brother, if we could escape this war and then be free from age and death forever, I would never choose to fight or join the champion fighters at the front. Nor would I urge you to participate in war where men win glory. But in fact, a million ways to die stand all around us. No mortal can escape or flee from death. So let us go. Perhaps we shall succeed and win a triumph from another's death, or somebody may triumph over us. I think this is a very rousing and moving speech in its acknowledgement both of privilege and of the inevitability of mortality. Sarpedon views military service not as a duty, not as an unconditional imperative, but as, as a choice that may make sense because he can see the limitations on his own powers, great as they are. In, those limitations are imposed by the knowledge that all of us, however powerful we may be, will die. One crucial element in this speech is the use of the first person plural. Sarpedon does not talk about why should, quote unquote, I risk my life, but why we should do so. We, you and me, Glaucus, comrades together, and we in general, the elite among the, the military class. His warrior ethic is focused explicitly on the trade of life for honor, but implicitly it's about the close bond he has with his comrade and with all his fellow tribesmen. This point matters because it's an essential element that distinguishes Sarpedon's account of the warrior code from the ways that a version of that code is articulated by the two most prominent characters in the poem, Hector and Achilles. So let's look first at Hector, the greatest warrior of Troy, the son of King Priam, defender of the city. Here's what he says to his wife Andromache in book six. She begs him not to fight alone outside the city walls, going out onto the plain to face the Greek forces. She suggests that he can fight more safely by sticking to the wall and defending the weakest patch in the wall so that if the Greeks try to scale the wall, there can be Trojan forces waiting for them. She insists that by adopting the higher risk military strategy, he's risking not only his own life, but also that of his baby son, who will, as we know from the mythic tradition, and as she says, be thrown from the city walls to his death by the Greeks. He's also risking the freedom of Andromache herself, who will soon be widowed, raped, and enslaved. So obviously she doesn't want him to do it because there are, there are clear reasons why taking the higher risk strategy is dangerous and not just for himself. But so here's what he says in reply. Sorry, it's listening. Great Hector in his flashing helmet answered, woman, I care about all those things too. But I feel overwhelming shame in front of the Trojan women in their trailing dresses and Trojan men if I shrink back from war as if I were a coward. And my spirit tells me I must not stop because I learned always to be a warrior and fight among, them, among the frontline champions of Troy to win great glory for the king my father and for myself. You see, my heart and mind know this for sure that there will be a day when holy Troy will be destroyed, and Priam, armed with his ashwood spear, and all our people. And yet, I do not care so much about the pain of all the Trojans in the future, of Hecuba and Priam and my brothers, my many noble warrior brothers dying at enemy hands and fallen in the dust. None of this matters more to me than you. One day some bronze-armed Greek will capture you, and you will weep deprived of all your freedom. But as for me, I hope I will be dead and lying underneath a pile of earth so that I do not have to hear your screams or see you dragged away to be a slave. This scene is, and this speech in particular is sometimes read and described as if it were primarily about Hector's sense of duty to his city and his community, his need to defend his people. And on some level, that is what it's about. But Andromache had, as I suggested, proposed another way to defend the city. So he, he's not disagreeing with her about the principle that the city should be defended. Um, Hector is rejecting a plan that would involve a greater chance of safety, but less chance for himself to gain individual glory. 
Unlike Sarpedon, he uses I, not we, in describing the, the warrior code. I want to be a warrior. He insists that fighting alone in the most high-risk manner possible is his only chance as an individual to avoid the pain of humiliation for himself, a pain that he rates more important than the pain that will be suffered by his enslaved wife, dead baby, and his sacked city. We can see a different, but I think comparable, focus on individual glory in Hector's counterpart, who will eventually kill him, Achilles, the greatest warrior on the Greek side. Achilles is so outraged by the behavior of Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, that he refuses to fight. The trade that Sarpedon suggests, by which the warrior trades military service to win social prestige, falls apart if the social prestige is no longer forthcoming or no longer seems sufficient. In Book 9, three of the other Greeks go to Achilles and plead with him to return to the battle because the Greeks are losing to the Trojans and many of Achilles' comrades are dying. But he adamantly refuses, insisting that the traditional trade of service for honor has been violated and there's no coming back. This is what Achilles said. I hate, like Hades gates, the man who hides his actual feelings and says something else. So I will tell you what I think is best. I do not think the son of Atreus or any of the Greeks can change my mind, because I got no thanks for all my labors, constantly battling the enemy. A man who fights his hardest in the war gets just the same as one who stays behind. Cowards and heroes have the same reward. Do everything or nothing, death will come. Why should the Greeks make war against the Trojans? Why did he gather group troops and bring us here? Was it not to retrieve the woman, Helen? Are they the only men who love their women, those sons of Atreus? All smart, good men love their own women and take care of them, just as I love that woman with my heart, although she was enslaved, held by my spear. But now that he has robbed me of my prize, stolen my winnings from my grasp and tricked me, let him not try to sway me. I know him. He will not change my mind. So I think this is a wonderfully vigorous and compelling speech of rage, which, like Hector's, shows the dangers of a warrior who focuses so intensely on his own individual glory that he forgets about the good of the collective. Hector and Achilles, both, unlike Sarpedon, repeatedly use the first person singular, I, me, my prize, insisting that the trade of service for honor operates only on an individual level. If I don't get my due honor, and my prizes, I back out of the whole system. Only much later in the poem, once Achilles has lost his beloved friend Patroclus, gone on an enraged and horrific killing spree in which he violates the norms of the Homeric battlefield by killing those who are supplicating him, begging for their lives and surrendering, um, he, Achilles then buries his comrade Patroclus with all due honors, including human sacrifice and at last restores the body of Hector to his grieving father. At that stage, Achilles seems to come around to at least somewhat of a different perspective. He's at last able to see himself not as a uniquely special individual, but as a piece in a much larger pattern. He uses the image of two wine jars held by Zeus, the most powerful god in the sky. And he tells Priam, the old man whose son he's just killed and with whom he's been weeping, Sit on a chair and let us hide our grief inside ourselves, despite our bitter sorrow. Nothing can be achieved by cold lamenting. The gods have spun for all unlucky mortals a life of grief while nothing troubles them. Two jars are set upon the floor of Zeus. From one, he gives good things, the other, bad. When thundering Zeus gives somebody a mixture, their life is sometimes bad and sometimes good but those he serves with unmixed suffering are miserable, and dire starvation drives them across the shining world. They have no honor from gods or mortals. Achilles goes on to cite his own father, Peleus, who will never welcome his son back home again, and Priam himself, who's lost his, his dearly beloved son Hector, as well as many other children who've, di who've died in the war, as examples of people who may seem terribly pitiable, their fathers who've lost or will soon lose their sons. But in the grand scheme of things, these men are lucky 
They did have sons. They did once have a flourishing home, even if it's all going to get taken away. The image of the two jars probably needs some explanation. In ancient and archaic Greece, people usually drank wine mixed with water, presumably because ancient wine was very nasty and full of sediment. Drinking unmixed wine was imagined to get you very drunk very fast, because it's so much stronger than the watery, normal drink that most people drank. The two jars of wine are like two wine jars. One has the mixed, mixed drink, and the other has the unmixed. Unmixed suffering, like a wine jar with nothing but water in it, um, is what many people in this world have, while the other is for the most privileged among us. It's a mixture of blessing and pain, like wine mixed with water, a drink for which we should be grateful. The implied third jar, containing only blessings, like unmixed wine or ambrosia, the food of the gods, is only for the immortals. No human, even the son of a goddess like Achilles, or the son of a god like Sarpedon, could hope to drink from that jar. Here, for the first time, Achilles acknowledges that he has enjoyed and continues to enjoy great privilege, great honor. And that remains the case, despite the fact that Agamemnon slighted him, despite the fact that he will soon, as he knows very clearly because of a prophecy, die in battle. Unlike the warriors who make a gamble, thinking, maybe I'll live, maybe I'll survive this battle, as Hector thinks maybe he'll survive the Trojan War, so we know he won't, Achilles knows for sure he's going to die. He's fated to be Minunthadios, a little while, a short while person. He runs fast to death, as well as runs fast on the battlefield. His days are numbered once he re-enters the battle. But now his self-pity over his own short life and his limited portion of glory, or Cleos, is gone. He's able to acknowledge for the first time that most people in the world never enjoy the kind of status that he himself has had. He can speak like Sarpedon in the plural, with an awareness of the responsibilities that special status brings with it, and with a greater degree of understanding of a large divine or cosmic context beyond the limitations of his own society. So Sarpedon talks about what we, we enjoy, we Lycians, or we, you and me, me, Glaucus. Achilles now has this broader perspective of being able to talk about we, mortal people on the earth. The ceasefire between the Trojans and the Greeks will only last 12 days. We know that when the poem ends, the war continues, the city will fall, Achilles will die. Achilles has this new perspective on his position as an elite warrior, and he's moved from rage and wounded pride to an awareness that his own suffering is part of a much larger whole and is far less than that of many others who have no honor at all at any period in their lives. So I'm just going to wrap up my talk and end by reading the final line, lines of the Iliad, um, which speaks, I think, these lines speak, I think, to the themes I've been emphasizing here in the poem's representation of warfare. War is the cause of grief, and it's the only way that mortal human, and the only way that mortal human beings can find some kind of solace and meaning amid all the suffering and death is through finding a place in a larger pattern or a collective community. The alienated Achilles can rejoin human society for the little time he has left alive, only once he can move from anger to grief and find a way to share his grief, even with Priam, who's on the opposite side in the conflict. Hector, who insisted on going out by himself beyond the city walls, is welcomed back into the community, back into the city, albeit after he's dead. The women who loved him sing songs of lament and of memory over him. Memorializing and telling the story of the fallen, fallen warrior is a way of bringing him back into the community and restoring to him the status and position that he has in that society and continues to have through retaining his name. The Iliad ends at this point. It doesn't tell, as I said, of the Trojan horse or the fall of the city. But in a sense, the death of Hector already portends the fall of Troy. And horse lord Hector is here in this, these final lines like a kind of Trojan horse, foreshadowing the end. He's welcomed into the city as the horse soon will be. So I'm just going to read those few lines, and then I'd love to have questions or comments from, from all of you. When newborn dawn appeared with rosy fingers, the people gathered round the funeral pyre of famous Hector. Once they were assembled, they quenched the pyre with shining wine wherever it smoldered. Then his brothers and companions, weeping, collected up all his white bones. Their faces streamed with tears. They carried them and put them in a golden chest and laid soft purple cloths to cover them and quickly lowered the chest into a fresh dug grave and heaped large stones on top 
set close together. Soon they heaped high the mound, and round about it stood guards on every side, in case the Greeks attacked too soon with all their weaponry. After the mound was built, they went back home, then gathered, and they held a glorious banquet inside divine King Priam's house. And so they held the funeral for horse lord Hector. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, please just line up at the microphones that are in the center aisles, please. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. My name's Cadet Tristan Monahan. My question is, what drove you to write your own translations of Homer's epics, and what sort of perspectives or new techniques did you use that you feel that previous translators, such as Fagel, did not take adequately into account? And feel free to get um, more linguistic into this. Uh, <laughs> yes, more linguistic would be, I mean, it's hard to do the, the more linguistic without a handout, but um, so one thing that drove me from the start was feeling that it was a shame that, um, or at least it, it just was something that I could provide differently. The fact that um, the majority of 20th and 21st century English translations of Homer are in either free verse or prose, but the originals are this beautifully metrical, rhythmical um, poetry that's designed to be performed out loud. So my translations are in iambic pentameter because I want the reader to have a sense, even if you're reading it on the page rather than listening to the audio book or, or a performance, to have a sense that this is a text that invites reading out loud, um, that invites some kind of performance and has a performability to it. Um, maybe more broadly, um, I wanted to bring out the, the proto-dramatic qualities of both the Iliad and the Odyssey, by which I mean not like high drama, melodrama all the time, but the diversity of perspectives and voices, such that each character has their own way of speaking and their own way of seeing the conflict and the, the experience of war, or the experience of homecoming in the case of the Odyssey. Um, I felt that there was a tendency um, in some, some of the popular translations to sort of refocalize the narrative as if it was all from the perspective of single, a single character, so all, the, all about Odysseus in the Odyssey, whereas I think the, both the Odyssey and the Iliad are constantly shifting their perspectives so that we see first what does it feel like to be Odysseus, but then also what does it feel like to be one of his men who doesn't get to go home, or what does it feel like to be Penelope or to be, to be Athena causing the slaughter of um, lots of humans and how fun that is um, from, the, from the goddess perspective. So I, I wanted there to be also just a sense of greater um, variety of style and greater variety of voices, and at the same time, in a way, a less variety in terms of rhythm, um, so that there should be this ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum kind of rhythm to it all the way through. I chose iambic pentameter rather than the original Greek is in dactylic hexameter, which was the normal meter for um, narrative poetry in archaic Greece. So I wanted to use, um, use, I think, the only meter which has something of an equivalent position within the English, poetic, English Anglophone poetic tradition. Um, it, it, that it's, it, ha, it already hints, once you hear that rhythm, you, you sort of get cued into, this is the language of Shakespeare, this is the language of Milton, this has this long history, and it can be reinvented for new generations. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but something like that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Wilson. My name is Major Thorbeck. Um, one, one thing uh, that has always mesmerized me about the Iliad is, I, I think in book 18, uh, when Hephaestus is, uh, is creating Achilles' shield, um, the, the description is, uh, as you know, extremely detailed. Uh, and, you know, I think I have some ideas of my own uh, on why that is, which are probably not very good. Uh, but I, I just, I can't help but to take this opportunity to, to get some of your thoughts on both the style and, and really, you know, what, what you think Homer was trying to communicate uh, in the story with, uh, with the shield of, of Achilles. That's a great question. Yes, I love that passage. Um, I, I love the, sort of the vividness of the whole description of the God's Forge and how does the craftsmanship happen. I mean, in a sense, that, that passage is one of the most um, 
meta-literary or meta-poetic passages because it seems that the narrator is sort of con uh, meditating on the process of what does it mean to try to represent the whole world, that the shield itself is like an epic poem, that he's going to carry this epic poem which shows, it, what it shows on the shield is the, the river ocean running, running around the edge of the, of the shield, but also running around the edge of the world. And within the shield, there's the, the city at war and the city at peace. Um, I think one of the most fascinating, there are a couple of things that I think are fascinating about the whole description of how does Hephaestus, the craftsperson, craftsman god, make the shield. One is just how, how totally unrealistic it is as, a, as an account of something which could be forged out of metals. Um, that it seems to be sort of constantly shifting from this is supposedly a um, mostly two-dimensional work of representation, and yet everybody, and it seems to be moving all the time, so it seems to be constantly closing the gap between how do you represent in visual art versus how do you represent using words where you can tell action over time. And then also the fact that it shows both a city at war and a city at peace. It shows a besieged city, like the city that we've been living with throughout the poem, the besieged city of Troy. But in this besieged city, there, there are certain differences from the besieged city of Troy. There's a use of sneaky tactics and ambush, which doesn't happen in, in quite the same way in the Iliad, except in Book 10. But also that the city of peace, which you might think, surely this poem, which presents Ares as the ruin of humanity, is going to show how idyllic it is, if only you could be in the world of peace. But, but what the city at peace shows is this conflict even in the civilian world, and that in the city at peace, there's a sort of proto-law law trial going on. People are arguing over somebody who's been murdered and trying to figure out how to create restitution for a person who's been killed. How do we pay back to his, his family, to the dead man's family? So I think it, it both shows that there's this aspiring to complete representation of what is the whole of life all about, which includes the whole of war, but also includes the whole of, whole of peace. And it reminds you that, in fact, there's conflict in both spheres, and in fact, in all the spheres, but there's also this marvelous shininess and this marvelous energy that even when supposedly we're, we're being shown in a static form, there's always all this movement and all this change and all this energy, and things are made of silver and bronze and gold, but they're also alive all the time. So I'm not sure that really answers the question, but I love that passage. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you could step to the side here. So I, we want to thank Professor Wilson for such uh, a thrilling opportunity to hear from her work in progress and for such a, a talk that focuses on two things we care a lot about here, which is close attention to language and war. Um, so we're pleased to present Professor Wilson with an engraving that represents a work from our archives, a sketch by Cadet William Tecumseh Sherman of Theseus slaying the centaur from 1838. Um, I like to imagine Cadet Sherman in one of the drawing rooms of old, creating this sketch using statuary or another piece of work as a guide, and it reminds us that the arts and humanities have been a vital part of cadet education since West Point's founding, and we want to thank you so, so much. Another round of applause for Professor Wilson. Thank you.